Hello, we are opening this week up with a nice, mellow, cold open. I want to say hello, and I'm excited to jump into sophomore year, not only of this podcast, but of my college experience, so that's really big. I want to do a quick cold open, tee up this episode, talk about the future, and then uh, roll right into it. So yeah, this is the first episode I've recorded back on campus with a guest. Beyond that, it's the first episode I've ever recorded in person as a podcaster before which is a really big deal, and I'm super excited for it. And I could not have picked a better guest and a better space and a better time to record. I talked to Nathan Newman, a fellow RA of mine who I met through the whole RA process, who was just, like, really, really cool guy and somebody I really enjoyed talking to just, like, generally throughout the halls, throughout training. And the more he talked, the more stories he shared. I'm like, okay, I have to get this guy on a podcast. So we sat down. We had a really awesome conversation, and it went for, like, a really nice long amount of time, which I absolutely loved. I want to break it up, so I'm going to split it into two parts, so you are listening to part one of my conversation with Nathan Newman. It's a great part one to the conversation, a lot of background on like his high school experiences and college experiences, kind of how and why he came to the University of Michigan, why he's studying engineering, and what his focus is on that, a lot of sustainability and clean energy, which is really, really cool and interesting stuff, and then you get to hear some great, fascinating stories about solar panels and high school commitments and activities that Nathan did that really ties it all together. Next week, we'll dive a little bit more into Nathan's high school experiences and also all of his like rapid fire fun fact uh, ultimate tip questions, which are also a really, really great section of the show. So if you're curious about that, please check in next week. It'll be a really, really fun time. But yeah, we're back in person. We've got the next two weeks of the podcast laid out, laid out. I think I meant to say planned and laid out, and I just combined it into laid out, which seems like a bowling alley term if I could say anything about it. But it's laid out for the next two weeks, and then I have some really exciting ideas churning for other guests to talk to, other things to do with the show that I cannot wait to kind of dive more into. So that's just about everything. One other slight note. I was just going through and checking in on the podcast and kind of updating like all the iTunes, making sure all the pictures are updated, and I popped onto our iTunes, which I hadn't checked in a hot minute. And this is like a really random thing that like I don't care about the numbers of the show. I don't care about how it's received. I do this so that I enjoy it. And I wanted to share it with people as a resource. And I was on iTunes, and we are at a 3 out of 5 stars, which made me laugh more than anything. We have a lovely 5-star review from somebody anonymous. And then somebody just dropped a 1-star review, which is, like, totally fine. I am curious. I didn't leave a blurb. And I'm like, if you have something to say, say it to my face, all right? Say it in my uh, say it in the comments section. You can't just leave a 1-star with no things. But... Beyond that, reviews of a podcast on iTunes affects whether or not it is pushed out to more or less people and, like, shown as much or kind of pushed to the front of, like, the recommendations. And so a 3 out of 5 star review, more than anything, just might mean that the student council gets kind of buried in things on iTunes, which I just don't want to have happen because I want it to be a resource that people know about that they can listen to and use in their college experiences. So that would be the only reason that, I like, if you are so inclined and are on iTunes and just want to, like, swipe out of the podcast and like you can keep listening i'll keep talking but like swipe down and pop a little five stars would mean the world to me just because it would really bump the average up with so few reviews every five star review every review matters a lot and so like bumping up that rating a little bit to kind of push us back towards the front of the search recommendations would be incredible just so that more people can know about this show and we can build out a bigger student council community with it but that's all from me quick little blurb about Nathan Newman and everything else. Welcome to the Student Council Podcast. I can't wait to dive on in. Enjoy the episode. Hello and welcome to the Student Council Podcast, an educational advice show made for students and by students where everyone is qualified to talk about their own experiences. This week, we're starting sophomore year. I am so excited. Maybe you can hear the energy in the room. I am joined by Nathan Newman from the University of Michigan, and it is the first in-person recording. But welcome, Nathan. Thank you for coming on the show today. Thank How's you for been? asking me, Carter. Um, I've been great. Okay. Uh, I've been back at school for like a week now, just kind of getting ready before classes start. And I don't know, life is great in so many different ways. Awesome. Speaking of great, speaking of being back for a week, do you have a favorite five minutes of the last week? I've had a lot of great five minutes in the past week. I, I could probably think of two. One would be, I, I talked to my brother uh, on the phone recently, and he's like my best friend, for Aww. sure. And him and I, like, we always just like laugh our asses off the whole time. Yeah. Um, just talking, and you know, we'll talk about like books that I've been reading, I was telling him you know, about 
picking up uh, the book called uh, Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius. Roman Emperor. Um, and, you know, him and I just had a whole talk about that, and that was just, you know, always a good pick up, pick me up, I should say. Yeah. Uh, and then the other five minutes, uh, I had a friend, uh, someone I met a year ago, right before I started my sophomore year, and we never met up for the past year, and like, this past Saturday, we met up for the very first time. You know, just like seeing her, I was just like, "Oh my god, this is great!" Because, like, I like that's one of the best things in life is just like having you know meetups with like people who are amazing and mm-hmm. um, special and everything. So, uh, I, that was definitely a highlight. Starting to rekindle like friendships because I've you know been gone all summer, so just starting to see familiar faces and stuff. Yeah, literally, I I saw my roommate yesterday from last year from freshman year and like it's i'm just so happy that like everybody's back on campus it's like it feels i'm like all right everybody's back like there's an energy with that to just see friends and do all this stuff for sure so you're a junior at the university of michigan ann arbor location um what has been your college experience what are you kind of studying what are you looking to do after graduation what's the vibe been so college i would describe it as being a challenging but fruitful chapter of growth uh, and self-discovery in my life. Uh, No shortage of hardship, uh, but no shortage of excitement, exhilaration, and happiness. Um, I'm studying electrical engineering, um, and, you know, in terms of what I hope to do with that, so long-term, uh, I definitely feel a calling for working on uh, clean energy, uh, in particular, uh, the nuclear industry. And there's a lot of potential I see there with um, new nuclear reactor designs that I want to work on and help bring into production for, you know, making like a cleaner, greener mm-hmm. world, as they call it. Yeah. Um, and electrical, like I, I definitely jumped around as I was going through middle and high school as to what I wanted to go to school for, but I felt like electrical was a good foundation for learning engineering. It kind of, um, it allows you to take that education in so many different directions, mm-hmm. and I felt like that was a good starting point um, for being a lifelong learner Yeah. Um, afterwards. And, and, you know, electrical engineering, as you said, is something that is kind of constantly being developed right now with, like, clean energy and new sources of that, so... I definitely think you're diving into a world that is still like very much to explore. Yeah. Yeah. How did that start though? I want to go back. Like when was engineering like the point for you? I remember like since I was extremely little when I started playing with like Legos and stuff, I think that was probably the first kind of um, epiphany where I was like, I really like learning how things work learning how to put the pieces of the puzzles together to make new creations. And it wasn't just that I was, like, pathologically drawn towards, um, you know, science or just, uh, you know, how things work. It was also just, I feel like I'm a creative person, you know, at Mm -hmm. heart, um, almost like an artist at heart, and engineering kind of allows me to take the things that, you know, I imagine and the things that I would like to see created in the world and it actually gives me the tool set um, to be able to bring those things into fruition because you learn the rules of how nature and the world works and then it's no longer like these creations have to stay in your imagination. Now you're like, well, I actually know how to put the pieces of the puzzle together. And yeah. I think that was kind of the uh, the start of it. That was kind of the foundational inspiration um, of why I chose this path. But there was also... Um, As I was going through middle school, I was part of this underwater robotics team where we would build like these underwater robots called ROVs, which stands for Remotely Operated Vehicle. And it was just, that was like a time of my life. Like I, it was a real storybook, like experience, Mm -hmm. um, great coach, great mentor, great team, um, almost like family. And I think I kind of became obsessed with like marine technology and the water. So I actually wasn't going down electrical, um, the electrical route for a while. I was interested in designing ships and submarines and uh, maritime vessels. So I was going to go down the naval architecture route. Wow. And, you know, I was committed to that for a while. That's what I told everybody I was going to do. It sounded cool. Um, I thought it was kind of a neat thing. But uh, 
And then at one point, I, the voice of reason, my brother, <laughs> uh, him and I were having a conversation. And this has happened at like the most pivotal moments in my life where him yeah. and I will have a talk where I'm like dead set on what I want to do. And he'll just mention something, like a little pearl of wisdom that he'll drop. And then it just turns my whole world upside down. And I'm like, oh, my God, that's a great idea. So he was like, well, you know, uh, I know you're like really passionate about climate change and you know securing a better future for the world um you know that ships uh kind of have a notoriously bad carbon footprint because once they get out out of a harbor and into international waters all the environmental regulations that countries put in place no longer apply to them so they'll just crank on like the big engines that are just pumping out greenhouse gases. Mm -hmm. So if you really, you know, care about this, I'm not sure if naval architecture is exactly going to put you in a position to work on that. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. Uh, so I kind of went through a bit of a reassessment there and eventually kind of found my love for a more fundamental engineering, which was electrical. Yeah. Um, so that, that's, that's a bit of the kind of the story there. There was also there was a period where I wasn't going to do engineering at all that I wanted. <laughs> it's so embarrassing. I was like dead set on being a hip hop producer. Okay. Um, so from about seventh grade through sophomore year of high school, yeah. I would obsessively go home every day and, you know, boot up my computer and just start churning, like composing songs and, um, you know, sometimes like writing lyrics to recording. Um, but it was primarily just, you know, my passion for, um, like, composing the music, I think, was the driving factor. I love just kind of the eternal search for the right notes and everything and, mm -hmm. you know, stuff that um, really speaks to, like, the soul, I guess. Like, that, that's yeah. where, like, my whole philosophy at the time with creating music was I'm not worried about, you know, using my ears as kind of the medium for um, what sounds good. I want to make music that generates emotion like I based on how it makes me feel is whether I consider it good or not so I was like it was my craft like that's what I did I didn't care about school anything it was just about the music and I was once again like oh I think I'm gonna go be a go to school for music production and my brother's like well you know one thing to think about is that if you go for music production the odds of being able to you know, make money to be able to afford high quality audio equipment and all that is lower. What you could do is go to school for engineering, one of your other passions, and then you'll have, you know, a good salary and all that. And then you can have the resources to pursue music, um, you know, with like the best equipment you can get. Right. And I was like, oh, that's a good thought. So that I think that started to nudge me back in the engineering direction. Uh, but that was not like, the thing that made me dead set on like a mission to you know do like the clean technology clean energy all that that was later as i was reading books and just became deeply inspired um by what like certain people out there were doing with you know companies they were building um so that was like when I, the rubber really hit the road that was kind of myself but there my brother definitely kind of nudged me in the right direction he's never told me like, hey, this is what you should do with your life. Mm -hmm. But he definitely uh, kind of hinted. He's like, hey, you might want to rethink this. And he was right in the end because um, I, I feel like I'm definitely on the right path that um, I'm happy with now. That's awesome. That's really, that's a cool saga to follow. The It was funny you talk about the engineering and like music track. I talked to a professor who, former UMich student, now a business professor in marketing, but he went, went to event for engineering, did not enjoy it, graduated, started like a music company, and then went down a whole marketing pipeline and was ended up working with like Beyonce and all that stuff. <laughs> so like, it's really funny how these paths intertwine. And I honestly, I mean, I feel like music kind of intersects with so many different like creative fields, like engineering or anything else in between. So, yeah. Well, yeah. it also, I think, speaks to the duality that I'm not just, you know, the non-creative, like, heartless like engineer right. who's purely about logic like there's deeply an artistic passion within that i think um is like half of who i am so it's kind of interesting to watch this like mm -hmm. 
it's almost like this Jekyll and Hyde thing within. It's like, do I pursue, you know, the art or do I pursue the engineering? But it's like, at the end of the day, you can do both. I yeah. think I'm more rooted in the engineering, but I always maintain um, the music wherever I go. You know, I don't, I don't try to leave that behind, I guess. Yeah, like they're both kind of barely toward the same conclusion, like mm-hmm. in a way. That's yeah. cool. I, I'm curious about U of M in particular coming to Michigan. Like, how did that kind of come up for you? Was Michigan like one of the big schools, top schools you were looking at? Or like, how did you kind of get to that point? So this is an interesting period, the college selection process. Mm-hmm. Um, well, when I was a senior in high school, I was... I was extremely focused on like the technical projects I was working on, the teams I was a part of, like robotics and um, all these different things. But one thing I definitely wasn't obsessed with was college. Like I, I, I was hoping that things would work out, but uh, I definitely had like a pretty average SAT score, and my GPA was not bad by any means. But it wasn't like based on the statistics I was reading about the average person that gets accepted to schools like U of M, I thought I was out for the count, like it wasn't going to work out. And I was like, well, this kind of sucks Um, because like U of M would be nice. It's really like the location that I would like to be at. I feel like, you know, I'm more of a cosmopolitan type of person. So going somewhere Mm -hmm. rural or a smaller town was not really what I was looking for. And so I was down in the dumps. It was weird, like, because I had all this, like, ambition in, like, my junior and senior year. I was working on all these things that I cared about. But when it came to college, I was just, like, thinking it wasn't, like, I was going to have to go to a college that I wasn't particularly interested in. And so I waited till the last hour of the last day to put in my application for U of M. And the only reason I did it is because I had a friend who went here from my hometown who said, you never know like Mm -hmm. don't assume you won't get in like you might as well just apply and see what happens so I you know made up the essays I filled out the application I was like yeah screw it let's see what happens and I didn't hear back for a while Um, no surprise they probably had the other 50,000 applications to get through before mine right Um, right so I was just, I was like, well, we'll see. And then I applied to some other schools like Michigan Tech, which is where my brother went. Oh, cool. Um, and that probably is where I would have gone that or Michigan State. I was kind of between the two. It was going to depend on financial aid and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, both would have been good schools. And then, you know, one day I got that email and I was like, holy shit. <laughs> like, yeah, right? <laughs> I was like, oh my God, like life just took a turn because I was actually... I, I was getting concerned. I was like, oh, man, what if I have to go to, like, you know, this school and I got to figure out, you know, this housing situation and all these different things. And I, I just I felt way less prepared. And then U of M, it's like they came in. They're like, hey, congratulations. I was like, OK, I'm saved. Life's going to be OK. It's going to yeah. work out. Uh, but, yeah, so I wasn't, you know, stressing about first pick, second pick college, all that. I just I knew that I wanted to pursue engineering and go to a reputable school um and and i had my hopes that it would be somewhere that felt more like home and i just it just so happened to be that ann arbor is like the exact kind of town that i wanted to hang out in for the next few years so yeah um i was more than happy but it definitely i did not have my uh, stuff together nearly as much as the next guy i think but it all works out. it all works out i don't think anybody had their stuff together when it comes to college app to be honest with you like yeah i i think some people i've met a lot of people and i tell them about the last hour of the last day and they're like you're making me nervous right now just hearing this story and i'm like i know i should have been nervous i don't know why i ever let myself do that but um yeah i was pretty fortunate i'm glad it worked out that's Um, cool yeah speaking of you talked about having to figure out housing in other schools um how about figuring out housing in michigan You know, we met because if we're both RAs now, but like, how has your housing journey been at U of M? So I started out um, on that place known as North Campus. Uh Uh-huh. North Campus, for those who don't know, is kind of like, it's like far removed from the central, you know, U of M kind of experience. It's kind of its own little college because that's where College of Engineering is, that's 
you know, school of music, theater, and dance, all that. It's kind of its own little world up there. And it's nice. Uh, you know, it's like nature filled, lots of trees. Um, it's quite lovely up there. But it definitely was an experience because I just felt like I was removed from downtown Ann Arbor and mm-hmm. what people typically consider the classic U of M experience, I guess. So I was, you know, worried about that. But the one thing I'll say is uh, the people that were there is what made it worth it because I met some of the best friends of my life in Bursley which was the dorm that I was living in Um, so I really can't complain about the time I spent there Um, I will say like in terms of just what housing is like I would say you know it's comparable to most average public universities Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's kind of standard what you expect when you go to a dorm Um, I would say uh, you know as a freshman like it wouldn't sweat about where you end up north campus central campus all that it's just like the people is really the key factor that you look for because that's what you take with you as you go forward in the coming years yeah that's a great answer what may like what prompted you to your decision to go back as an ra sophomore and then junior year yeah so um ra so there's kind of three things i would say um that kind of led me to this so first it was my love for interacting with people, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I'm very much a people person. I love meeting new people. So whenever, you know, it's moving and you got all these parents and new students coming in and it's like, there's a reason that I love just going on, a, you know, the community walk, just checking in on people, trying to help out because I just love, you know, making new friends and, um, you know, helping people out. So that was definitely a factor. The other thing is, you know, whenever I try to put myself in a job or a role I try to align it with my talents Mm -hmm. and so I think you know my ability to lead others and kind of be um, a leadership figure was something that I felt I was talented at and I could benefit you know kind of um, the community by (laughs) basically being an RA so yeah you know I I thought well this is a job that I could do you know I'm a social person but I'm also um, you know I feel like I'm pretty decent when it comes to leading groups Um, And then the other part, of course, is like the financial benefit because, you know, I don't come from like a wealthy family. So I was like trying to be smart about how could I be strategic and set up my college experience so that I'm not, you know, taking out exorbitant amounts of loans and everything. So that was definitely kind of the third pillar um, of why I went with it. And then coming back, you know, for junior year, I would say the same thing. You know, I, I had a positive experience the first go around and here we are now. Here we are now. I'm really glad. Any any tips you would give to new RAs? I'd say that the best thing you could probably do is be authentic. I, I know that, like, kind of the stereotypical RA is kind of, like, far removed from their residents in terms of, like, they're not con- viewed as one of them. You know, everyone kind of mm-hmm. looks at them as, like, the police officer. You know, like, don't don't interact with the RA. Like, just try to steer clear. But I think if you can be a genuine and authentic person you know just be like the chill ra who takes the time to get to know people i think that's probably one of the best things you can do because i found like that that's how it worked with my first go around um, with my residents like even as they were moving in i I was hesitant to just come straight out and say hey i'm your ra first i just introduced myself as a person started to have a conversation and then i'd mention it during the conversation later Mm -hmm. on but you know, the focus should be on building authentic relationships. And I would not just recommend that for someone wanting to be an RA, but just life in general. Yeah. I think authenticity is probably the number one quality I look for in other people. And it's probably the number one quality that another person could exhibit if they, you know, want to have success in relationships and building community. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. I think that it's so critical to all elements of life, but I think it can get kind of muddled when you're thinking about stuff like RA or especially like those kind of like weird, like awkward leadership dynamics, oh, if yeah. that makes sense. Like I think a lot about that to stuff in high school too when like I'm club president, but everybody else is also in this club and we're all kind of on the same page, yeah. but like there's a weird type, like just being authentic, you know, not letting that stuff like, you know, not letting a title or kind of a role get in the way of Absolutely. anything else is really important. Yes. Yeah. 
Now, I want to dive back into your high school experience, because you were talking to me about this the other day, and I was like, okay, cool, we have to have you on the show now. Um, not I, Even before that, I was like, okay, I just have to get this person on a microphone. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I want to talk you, about man. Shoe Club. Tell me what is Shoe Club, and then just let's start there. What is Shoe Club? So Shoe Club is uh, it's a club started by one of the teachers uh, at my, well, technically he was a middle school teacher, and it, w- it was built for middle school students as kind of a club dedicated around leadership and empathy. So I think the kind of premise behind it is we had this one motivational speaker come in um, and he talked about, you know, students struggling and kind of like finding the value within yourself. And after that, there were all these, you know, students who started coming up to this one teacher, um, his name is Matt. And they would kind of start sharing their stories with him and because he was a very empathetic guy and, you know, he would always Mm -hmm. listen. And he started to realize that there was like a serious um, opportunity here to, you know, give students kind of an outlet to start to learn about empathizing with other people. Um, And so he built the shoe club. And basically the reason it got its name is because you're trying to walk a mile in someone else's shoes, Mm -hmm. you know, learning to be empathetic learn who they are and you know the symbol the shoe goes further than that because you know kind of one of the other aspects is that this teacher he would reach out to famous people who've done you know accomplished milestones done amazing things and request them to send in a pair of shoes and kind of share the story behind those shoes like where they you know use them so he's got I feel like hundreds of shoes at this point of like, you know, LeBron James, probably uh, like Jay Leno, like astronauts, um, like just the most famous people in the world. And one of them I remember, I think was uh, an astronaut who was probably the first Native American to go to space, I believe. And the shoes he sent in were the shoes he wore. Well, I think he was doing like, they, they put him in like an underwater kind of like facility to kind of simulate living on the ISS yeah um and he was like these were the shoes that I was wearing while I was in training and so it'll be stuff like that or the guy who invented the telephone all these things not the telephone that'd be Alexander Graham Bell cell phone (laughs) okay Um, you know stuff like that um so he's got just like all these shoes like everywhere you know in the classroom and so this that was kind of the beginning of it and the shoe club you know it started to grow um, when I entered high school because uh, Matt brought me on as kind of a mentor to these middle school kids mm-hmm. and he knew about my technical background um, from the robotics teams that I was on um, as I mentioned earlier the underwater robotics club which we can talk about later yes. if you want to know that story but um, he, he knew my technical background and so as a mentor that was kind of like where my contribution came in is I was like helping come up with ideas for, you know, these technical projects we could do and involve the kids. And the first one was actually Matt's idea. He was like, what if we, you know, took a weather balloon with a little kind of platform on it, you know, and and mounted some GoPros and a shoe and just sent it up into the (laughs) upper atmosphere, caught the whole thing on video, and I guess, you know, send a shoe to space more or less. And I was like, this sounds pretty cool. You know, there were some people on YouTube who'd done similar things. Mm -hmm. And so it was my job to, you know, find this kind of apparatus, find the weather balloon, do all the engineering calculations about, you know, how many Newtons of force we needed um, pulling from the balloon upward. And there's like a whole video on YouTube uh, that we put together and uh, like kind of documented the project and uh, the launch day. And it was such a wild ride. like because we we sent up the balloon and we had a GPS tracker on it that we all had our phones synced up to Mm -hmm. and we started realizing that this thing was moving like we're like it's already in grayling it's only been 15 minutes like it's an hour away from us and so we all hopped in our trucks and like cars and we started hitting the road trying to track this thing down because we need to recover the GPS or um, the GoPros obviously to get the footage so we started driving and we're just tracking this thing. It was like turned into this little adventure. We went across the state of Michigan uh, in our cars until finally uh, the balloon touched down in some like field 
like I can't remember it was down by like Claire or Mount Pleasant or something like that and you know we we get the balloon and at one point we saw this helicopter fly over like really low to the ground and we're like oh no like who called the feds like right. are, they, are they coming for us but we got the balloon uh popped the SD cards into the laptop and the footage was corrupted it didn't capture no. any of it and we were crushed and so finally we collected ourselves and said all right we're going to get the resources together and we're going to do one more launch and we'll hope it works out. And this time we mounted two GoPros. We're yeah. like, we are taking insurance on this baby. We're not taking any chances. And we were working with like the local um, you know, weather station, learning about how the wind would be on various days, like a couple weeks out. So we could pick like the perfect day where the, this balloon was not going, or the apparatus was not going to land in the middle of Lake Michigan or something. Mm-hmm. So it ended up landing in the middle of a local lake um that was pretty close by it was probably 45 minutes from our hometown and we uh went out in kayaks and stuff started looking for this thing and then i looked at the gps tracker and this thing starts moving across the lake and we realized somebody picked it up in their boat or something like that and so we then it like shows up at this person's house so we drive over to this house you know it's like some private residence go to like this you know beach um like we basically walked down the walkway to the backyard after we got like permission Mm -hmm. and we still couldn't find it then finally we go to this public beach and we see it sitting on top of this person's kayak and uh they were just getting ready to call like the phone number we'd written on uh like the piece of paper that we had sitting on there Mm -hmm. to try to let us know that they'd recovered it and that's when we got the footage and we're like this is great yeah so that was like the first project and then the next year um we were you know trying to put together something else and once again, reviving my underwater robotics experience, I, we were in talks with the Department of Natural Resources and they said, hey, you know, we got to do this underwater survey of like sediment and all these things that we'd set up kind of for the uh, marine life living underwater. And normally we send scuba divers down to check on these things, mm-hmm. uh, take samples and whatnot. But that's pretty expensive to hire someone to go down. And then I was like, well, I got this robot that I built uh, (laughs) specifically designed for stuff like this. We could just go out on the, you know, the ship with you guys. I could pilot this thing down there, take some samples, um, and, you know, we could do this for you for nothing, like for free, basically. And so they took us up on it, or took us up on this, and uh, I got, I ended up building a new um, kind of, it was like a new tool for collecting the sediment. It was like a little um, box, basically, that would, you know, you'd go down, scoop up, and then you'd bring it back up to the surface. And uh, we'd, you know, collect samples, go down, and it was it was crazy. Like, the, they took us out on, like, a g- pretty giant ship as far as Great Lakes ships go um, yeah. for, like, local lakes and stuff. And uh, it, was, it was really fun. And then... Senior year. Senior year. Now, this is the big one. Let's do this. We're like, all right, let's go out with a bang. So Matt came to me, and uh, it was the first day of school. And, of course, this was during COVID. And he was like, well, clearly the shoe club is not going to be able to do the normal types of things that we're used to doing, like cooking classes and going on field trips because everything's shut down like you know our school was uh running because this was 2021 Mm -hmm. um like as we were starting to try to work with it you know covid like restrictions and lockdowns were lifting a bit but uh we're like all right we need to come up with a project that we can still do that you know working within kind of the limitations of where the world's at right now and there was always kind of this idea circulating about oh clean energy is there anything we could do with that and when Matt came to me, he was like, you know, first talking about, hey, maybe we could like install a single solar panel, you know, power a couple lights in a classroom, you know, keep it, keep it small, keep it simple. <laughs> and I was like, hey, that, this sounds pretty good. Um, and the idea of it, just the idea of working with solar energy, you know, trying to do a project around this, I was like, hey, there, this is like the best project I could imagine going out with in my senior year like this is something I believe in um, no matter the scale of what it was and so I was like yes like I'm your guy because he once again asked he's like will you help me do this and so I was like yes so I kind of became like I guess technical director whereas Matt was sort of the um, overall like 
coordinator you know he was Mm -hmm. the one um you know obviously helping uh lead the shoe club students you know middle school students who ended up helping out with this project so uh to my pleasant surprise it didn't end up being one solar panel for a couple lights it inflated uh as we started to talk with experts and specialists in the area who you know were experienced building um, solar arrays they started talking to us about oh yeah you could put up like a 10 kilowatt system it'll cost about this much and you know you could just kind of have a, an array of solar panels and this is this is like how much you would need to have an appreciable amount of energy generated and you know at one point we were thinking okay 10 kilowatts like that that's reasonable it'll probably cost like Meh, twenty thousand dollars or something like that. Mm-hmm. We could do that. That's manageable. So we started working on that. We started working towards the goal, talking with experts, uh, writing grants, trying to get donors. Um, and I, I did all the research. I typed up an eight-page white paper, which is kind of like the cross between a research paper and a marketing proposal, or, or like a proposal, basically. Mm-hmm. You know, you're like saying, "Hey, here's all the facts and information." Here's the proposal that I'm recommending. And this is what we sent out to the school board, to the donors and everything. And so that was kind of like the early stages. And then as we started to get traction and things gaining momentum, I was like, hey, you know, we could do more with this. (laughs) And so we were, I remember this one time we had the superintendent of our school on a call with us and Matt was there and I was there. And we were talking with... um, like one, I think one of the potential solar installers or one of the specialists, and uh, we were originally planning like doing like a ten to fifteen kilowatt solar array, and I was like, hey, uh, like realistically, if what would you recommend like a twenty or thirty kilowatt system? Like, do you think that that's feasible? Because I was really trying to hint at like, hey guys, like we could really do something here. And I remember the guy saying, like, yeah, like a, tw- like a 30 kilowatt system is, or, or and I think he said, yeah, t- I would go with a 20 kilowatt system because that's like a pretty substantial amount of energy that you'll be generating. It's a much more appreciable size. And so that's, that was the goal. So, you know, after we had all these grants coming in, we started get, re- getting in like thousands of dollars worth of support. Um, we were going out into the community doing presentations. We probably did like, 10 to 15 presentations I feel like to various different groups and it was amazing and at one point as we we hit the $20,000 mile or not the $20,000 it was like we hit a milestone for the 20 kilowatt solar array like we were like oh man we're on track to like hit this easily like we're gonna have enough money for this what was that milestone like what was that number I gotta think it was probably like Forty-five thousand to fifty thousand, maybe. Like it was like no forty way. to fifty thousand, I think. Yeah. Um, it was probably within that range, and I was like, "All right, guys, like <laughs> we we have a choice here. Like we could settle with our success up to this point, or we could up the ante and increase our ambition because I think we could go take this further." Um, and it was a unanimous vote by every middle school student, myself. <laughs> We're like, we're going to up the goal to 30 kilowatts now. The new goal is $70,000. And this was like blown out of proportion. Like no, this was the largest student-led project in our school's history by a long shot. Yeah. And we're like, oh, this is getting spicy. So we had a GoFundMe. Uh, that it was like the final like 15000 that we needed um, to close the deal. And that was the hardest part because you're getting like, ten dollar donations thirty dollar donations mm-hmm. um and you're just trying to get the whole community to get behind this project and you know the interesting thing is like the town you know i lived in it was like a small rural town like you know these kinds of things like clean energy you know those sorts of like policies you wouldn't think were very popular in a town like this but like it was absolutely amazing that everybody got behind this like we didn't have many if any detractors at all about what we were doing like people of all types of all different beliefs about you know you know political um like people who were on very different ends of the political spectrum were still happy to be like supporting this project and that to me was like the most inspiring aspect because we literally got the entire community behind this thing yeah and 
they all came through for the GoFundMe. It was amazing. And I remember, you know, we finally hit our goal. We exceeded like the 70,000, um, like by a long shot. And we were like, okay, all the extra money that we're getting from this point from the GoFundMe is just going to go towards education. We're going to teach kids about the solar energy. We're going to teach them about how it works, you know, kind of all these different things. And, uh, you know, we hit the 30 kilowatt mark and, um, you know, what was, what was crazy is that during this time, this was when that uh, giant snowstorm hit Texas where mm -hmm. their entire like energy grid got knocked out. And because of that, the entire supply chain for electrical generation was geared towards Texas. So then we started, we got a phone call from the installer that we had picked from the bid process and he was like, hey, uh, if you guys want to have these solar panels by Earth Day of 2021, basically, it was April 22nd was our goal. Um, it was actually a five-month yeah. timeline that we had to rate, go from zero dollars to 70000 In five months? Five months. And uh, he's like, if you want to have this by the date, you know, April 22nd, you're going to have to put it in order, like, right now. Otherwise, you might get stuck in this Texas supply chain thing. And so we were worried because we were still, like, couple thousand like several thousand dollars shy of our goal like maybe ten fifteen thousand mm -hmm. and we had to make the call we're like okay do we believe that we can make this you know that we can make it to the end essentially and or should we just call it quits right now and be satisfied with what we've got you know kind of lessen our expectations and we're like no like buy the 30 kilowatt array we're gonna make the money and we did you know the community came through um, and we had a whole ribbon cutting ceremony on April 22nd. You know, we had Matt went up and uh, gave a talk at the podium. We had a couple middle school students, superintendent. I went up and gave a speech. Mm -hmm. um, it was just, it was an amazing day. We had all the donors and people who'd supported us along the way came out and, um, you know, to see things go through to the end and to watch yeah. the ribbon cutting. Uh, we had a bunch of news coverage, like I think... Um, Nine and Ten News, which covers like a lot of the like Middle Michigan and Northern Michigan um, news, like they uh, had a show called The Four. I think was like two talk show hosts, and they covered us, and it was just it was amazing. It was like dream come true. Yeah, so that that was that, and then we had like a TV screen set up in the school that would monitor how much uh, CO two we'd been offsetting, how much energy we generated, and. The, the cool thing is, like, all these things are mounted, like, at the front of the school where all the middle school students walk in every single day. Yeah. And it's a middle high school, by the way. It's, like, okay. it's not just middle school. It's, like, the middle school and the high school students all in the same building. So as they're coming in, you know, off the buses every morning, they're seeing this gigantic solar array mounted on the roof. And I just, it's going to be up there for 30 years. And that excites me because they're going to be able to look at that and say, hey, like, these were students that did this, you know. It was very much a student-led, student-driven endeavor. Um, so it was an amazing, breathtaking, inspiring project. Um, so that's what, that's what the shoe club that's was all about. And that's what that, That's the story. No way. I love so many elements of it. I think the leap of faith element, like, aspect at the end, like, trusting in your community, even to even after raising, like, $50,000, $60,000, that alone in five months is incredible. Yeah. For like, because like, what was the size of your high school? Uh, my graduating class was 50. That's incredible. Yeah. Like, that's so cool. I just like picturing you and like an army of middle schoolers, like, we want more solar panels, which is really cool. So that's beautiful. And is that the origins then of Emperor and Newman? That has been part one of the student council with nathan newman check back next week for the last half of that interview nathan goes into a lot more pieces of advice and details about you know ultimate tips song recommendations you know the drill so on and so forth but he's got some really really awesome tips in there that you do not want to miss coming out next week that's all for me this week. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Student Council. You know where to find us, but if you don't, our email is stucopod at gmail.com and our Instagram is stucopod at stucopod. I trust that you can figure it out. I believe in you. Now, that's all from me. I hope you had a great rest of your day listening to this. I just hope it went well. I hope if you're a first year kind of going through orientation week this week, that that's going really well. I wish you the best of luck and the best of times there specifically. And I wish you the best of luck and the best of times in all of your educational endeavors. We're covering all the bases this week. 
Thank you very much for listening. And also, the Student Council is adjourned.